Um, our next speaker will continue the theme. Anthony Farrier uh, is a Sydney University, Sydney University um, alumni, uh, a graduate of our Master of Commerce program, an executive advisor, thought leader in corporate innovation, employee engagement. Uh, he talks about how many of the innovation programs and organizations often uh, fail on the wrong track and what can be done to instill some sense into and some uh, real innovation into these programs. Um, Anthony, please. Hey everyone. Great. Okay, well thank you everyone for having me today. Um, like I mentioned, my name is Anthony Ferrier. Um, I'm a New York City based consultant, executive and thought leader within the innovation space. I've got about 15 minutes with you, so I'm gonna be moving pretty quickly. Um, and I'll just run through some slides and talk to you about what I believe is happening in the innovation space is corporate innovation has been around as a comp competency for probably the last 10 to 12 years. It really came out of um, the growth within G of the GFC crisis that took place, right? What happened there was organizations suddenly found themselves in a position where they were being attacked by the fact that they, by the investors, by their investors, their employees were demotivated, they were getting starting these new, new startup organizations that were starting to attack them in terms of coming up with new ideas. And so they were really trying to come up with leaders within these businesses that were trying to come up with ways to sort of like, initially, quite frankly, to re-engage employees, right? And so come up with a positive message to drive out to their employee base to sort of get people re-motivated and get new, new thinking moving forward, right? And to move beyond what often happened in the terms of the risk profile, right? How do we, you know, we've gone through this, this crisis, we're in the middle of a crisis, the risk profile of the organization is dro dropping through the floor. How do we address that as an organization and try and sort of balance things out a little bit more? What's happened since that time for the last 10 years is we've grown as a mature, we've matured and grown as a competency and are creating more value. But I believe that there's still some problems and I actually believe we're getting to a, another crisis point within the innovation community just because of some of the practices we're doing. So what I'm gonna be doing today is talking a little bit about what I believe is happening within the space and some steps that we can all take to sort of create more uh, impactful and impressive and uh, profitable innovation programs for our organizations. Okay, um, so let's just talk about some of the positives of the innovation space at the moment. I think some things is where um, the C-suite within a mature, and when I'm talking about innovation programs, I'm generally talking about mature, established organizations, right? Um, and so within that kind of space, what's happening is leadership within that space is kind of recognizing now that, they're, that they have to innovate, right? And that's been the case for some time. But what's happening is there's been a push towards more radical disruption, right? And so these leaders, when they've been looking in the past, they've been kind of sort of thinking, well, we, we've got to innovate and we've got to talk about it and you know, we'll put it in our annual report like Pete Williams mentioned. Uh, but what happens now, they're actually recognizing they've got to actually do this a little bit more. And what they're recognizing is they've got to push a little bit more towards disruptive innovation, right? Because what they're seeing is there's new competitors being established in every single industry sector and in every industry vertical that are driving change mm -hmm. and are creating a, a momentum and a need for disruption by, um, by communities of users and consumers because they're, rec they're kind of saying, we want to be disrupted. We want new products that are coming out that are going to change the marketplace and going to change the way we interact with you as a company, right? And so these established companies are recognizing that and their leaders are recognizing that as well. Um, employees are demanding innovation and it's employees and consumers like I mentioned right um, especially with the millennial workforce in the US at least they are now the largest block of employees um, as, a, as a, a demographic group right so they're the ones that are kind of saying they don't want to work for mature and established organizations they want to work for the new kind of funky interesting companies right and so they're pushing these mature established businesses to come up with more innovative kind of thinking right both as employees but also as consumers um, there's an increasing acceptance of the innovation profession. Up till about three or four years ago, innovation was often given to people as a reward and recognition for good service in another function and, and role, right? You've done a great job. There's this new innovation thing we're setting up. We'll put you on it and, and give it a go and see how it works for the first year or two, right? And what you're seeing is that kind of like is dying away. And what's this recognition that innovation is actually a competency that is actually something we all do. You're seeing kind of groups turn up around in Europe and the US and somewhat in Australia where they're kind of doing accreditation for innovation kind of roles. You're seeing a lot of universities come out with that now. And so you're seeing more of this kind of acceptance of that. And that's coming through in terms of practical application as well. So um, Whirlpool in the US about nine months ago um, had a group that was, um, they're very well known as an innovation kind of company, um, but they uh, recently got rid of their innovation program and their teams because um, they recognized that they were, um, 
they've given these people this role as a reward, right? And they replace them all with innovation professionals and they're getting more success being driven for them as a, as a group from that, that, that change. Um, uh, the competency continues to mature and develop. Some of the, you know, we've all been doing this for a number of years now, so you're seeing a lot more, um, you know, people learning from their mistakes and moving beyond that. And there's, there's this digital transformation alignment that's taking much more active place. And I'm seeing much more of that in Australia than I see in the Europe and Europe and the US, right? So I think Australia is actually a leader in that. Pretty much every innovation program I work with in Australia is focused on um, connecting between uh, digital and, and innovation. So that's some positives. I tend to see myself as a positive person, uh, but let's look at some negatives, right? Some opportunities and challenges that could be improved. So now an example of that is that the C-suite have a very much, I believe, a disconnect in terms of what they expected to happen for innovation programs and what is actually happening. And that's creating a sense of frustration, especially over time, because what's happening is they've been investing in innovation programs at this point now for a number of years. So their investments are kind of ramping up and sort of like growing over time, but what's happening is they're not actually seeing the, um, the suggested successes that were going to take place, right? What's also happening as well is innovation leaders are often presenting their thinking in ways that don't necessarily, necessarily align with the, with the needs and goals of um, the corporate leadership and business unit leadership. And so they're cre this, that's creating a disconnect with the, uh, with the innovation groups, right? And, and what's happening is innovation kind of people are talking in a certain language where the uh, business unit people are talking in a different language. And that disconnect's creating tension within the, within the, within the space. Um, what's also happening is there's a lack of financial impact. And Pete Paul talked about before about you know, avoiding the stage gate kind of model, and I totally agree with that. But what happens, and this is within the language kind of context as well, innovation leaders are often using soft metrics but as a sign of success. So they might talk about the fact that they've put on a certain amount of programs. So many ideas were generated out of it. So many people attended. It got rated in a certain way. All these metrics, which, which we might look at and think, well, that's great, we're doing a great job. And we're talking about changing, building a culture of innovation, and that's what we're working towards, and that's all good. But the leadership of the business is often looking to financial impact, right? Or a differentiator in the marketplace. And what's happening is we've got to, we're not presenting that to them. We're not saying, here is how we're creating a financial impact to the organization. I was recently meeting with a, le um, a leader of innovation program at one of the major four banks in Australia, and they were only just starting to get their head around the fact that they had to create financial impact. And they talked about the fact this program had been in place for years, and they were like, well, we're just starting to sort of talk about you know, the financial impact of some of the ideas we've been generating, or the fact that they've been kind of like working with clients around this and trying to sort of start to track that. That is a fundamental mistake. And what actually happened, by the way, is that group were actually kind of disbanded three or four months after I spoke to them, right? And I believe a fundamental reason for this, because there just was that disconnect, right? They weren't talking about the financial impact. And then what's also happening is, you know, we're in an environment now where, um, a competitive environment where the world is shifting and changing, and companies are sort of like moving and, and sort of like, and leadership is changing every sort of nine to 12 months. And what's happening is there is a position where, um, the innovation kind of function, the innovation and attention is moving on. And we're in a very difficult position where there are new initiatives that are coming out that are taking over the, uh, the, taking over the attention of leadership and innovation is kind of being left in the dust because they haven't adopt, adopted, ad adapted enough to sort of be successful. So why don't I talk about some steps, now that I've got a bit of view, I'll talk quickly about some steps that I believe you can take to, create, to continue to create success for your innovation program going forward. I believe, I, you know, I've been in the innovation space now for about 10 years. I come from a marketing corporate strategy background. And I believe what's happening is, as when, I look, when I talk to innovation people within the marketplace, a lot of us are doers, right? We want to do an activity. We want to drive success. If success is us is driving an activity, right? Let's do a hackathon. Let's create an innovation challenge. Um, let's, you know, do a training program, it, you know, on and on, right? But what happens is, we're, by doing that, what we're doing is positioning ourselves as not being strategic, right? And so what happens is we have to have a very robust innovation strategy framework for ourselves, but also what happen, has to happen is that innovation strategy has to be tied into the overall strategy of corporate and coming down to the business unit set of strategies as well, right? So we have to position ourselves as strategic players, not just for what we're doing, but also play an active role in the strategy development at a corporate and a business unit level as well. And that changes the perception of us as leaders within the organization. Because at that point, what we're doing is aligning ourselves with what their business unit, what our client, our internal clients are talking about, 
right? They're not focused so much on the actions. They, what they want to do is make sure that they're aligned with what we're doing and that we're helping address the corporate, um, the, the strategic issue that they're trying to deal with. And by us playing a role within that kind of process, we can position ourselves much more strongly for success. To the point that was made by Peter, um, you know, and like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the time there's a lot of talk about us as a company being disruptive, right? We're going to be, we're going to disrupt the marketplace by this. We're going to be doing, create these new products that are going to disrupt the, the world and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. But what the reality is on the ground, the organizations aren't often set up for disruption. What they're set up for is incremental improvements. And that's a legacy and a history of the organization being driven by some of the um, initial, um, the, the lecturer who was talking initially, was talking about you know, the, in the Clay, Clay Christensen model of disruption. You know, these companies are set up, organizations we work for are set up for incremental improvements and efficiency drivers, right? And so they talk about disruption, but they don't really want it a lot of the time. That is starting to change, however, right? Because every industry sector, like I mentioned, is being attacked by startups that are driving disruption. And so what happens is you have to, as a, as a leader, you have to navigate a fine line of being able to sort of drive and push a disruptive agenda as part of a broader pipeline, which includes some incremental improvements. But you have to manage for that disruptive effect, disruption effectively and be ready for it and drive that forward. Because what will happen, you'll see, as you know, um, we get pushed towards doing incremental improvements a lot of the time. We have to maintain that drive towards disruption. We can't push it too much because that will sort of start annoying people and they'll get cranky with us and they'll undermine us. But you have to have a fine line to sort of pushing that forward instead of being one of the person that kind of owns that. You need to have transparency. Um, a lot of innovation programs over the last kind of like four years or so, up till about three or four years ago, Innovation was uh, driven um, out a message of the dark arts. We're the innovation people. We own this kind of role, right? New idea development, that's something we do. You, everyone else, don't do it. You can give us an idea and we'll develop it for you, but we're in an ivory kind of tower and we'll own it. That is a fundamentally flawed problem and, 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 and approach. And you're seeing a lot less of that, right, which is good. And what you're seeing is more broad scalability for the innovation thinking. Training people at a broad level around how to be innovative how to come up with new ideas, how to access channels. If you come up with an idea, how do you position that idea effectively so it can be reviewed and, and approved and move forward in a way? And not necessarily doing a business plan like uh, Pete mentioned, but have ways it's very easy to get an idea to move forward within the context of the organization and can be positioned in a way that addresses the needs of the business and doing that at scale so that everyone has that responsibility. Financial results. I talked about this earlier. Um, you can't be focusing on the soft metrics. And this is part of the crisis of innovation I see at the moment. Innovation is being perceived as soft and fluffy these days. You need to be able to go out there and talk about the financial impact you're going to be driving to the organization. There are different ways you can do that. You can use examples of like net present value, for example. Um, but you, you have to come up to a financial impact at some point. You generally, if you're starting an innovation program, you've got 12 to 18 months to use those soft metrics. But pretty soon after that, you need to come up with some financial metrics or you're going to be out. And a lot of the change you see, when I talk to innovation leaders within the space in Australia, you're seeing people that are generally in their tenure for 12 to 18 months and then they move on to something else, right? You don't see a lot of longevity in our space. And I believe this financial sort of impact is part of that reason. In the States and in Europe, you see more of that. Sorry, more longevity, right? And often because they're driving towards a financial impact gender right from the very first days they started their role. I talked before about how um, you know, we're in this environment where there's constant change within leadership, not just within innovation program leadership, but within corporate and business unit leadership. That is being driven by this constant, constant disruption that's taking place across every industry sector. Like I mentioned, leadership's attention as a result is constantly shifting and changing. Leadership are changing. Every time a new leader comes in, they've got a new initiative they want to drive. What's very important is for innovation leaders is to position themselves in a way that they can support new initiatives when they get released into the business, right? And so you need to sort of like, if there's a new one, new initiative about growing our business into China, how can an innovation program support that, right? You don't want to be creating new work. You want to be supporting the strategic goals of the business and the new initiatives. Position yourself as a way to align yourself up with those initiatives. You've got the channels in place. You've got the resources in place. You've got the skills and knowledge. Utilize that towards the, existing, the new initiatives as they kind of pop up within the organization. We need to speak the language of business. Often we get dinged because we talk in language that doesn't replicate what the business unit and the corporate leadership are talking about. 
and we get, and that's a very, very easy way for us to be discounted as once again soft and fluffy. We need to be able to be in a position where we can, we can talk the language that these leaders are talking about. And finally, what I see in Australia is a very much a drive across every single problem that takes place is let's use design thinking or, you know, human-centered design. Let's throw that at this problem because that's what we do, right? I see that as much overused in Australia as it compared to Europe and the US. In the US, design thinking is a relatively small part of, a method, of the methodology skill set that the innovation teams use these days. Where in Australia, it seems to be dominant across everything. The problem with de design thinking is great, right? Understanding what your customers' needs are, developing in, in a very process-oriented kind of approach, new thinking and new ideas, and making sure that they kind of work and sort of respond to client needs effectively, absolutely makes sense. But there are very few companies that have the stomach to, to manage these things effectively and properly, and to be, for design thinking to be done properly. And design thinking does actually need to be done properly. You know, half-assing it doesn't really work, unfortunately. And so what I'd encourage you to do is think about what are other methodologies that replicate a speedier, quicker, cheaper approach to developing new thinking that is being used in other parts of the business. So an example of that is like Lean, for example, which is used across technology companies, very quick and sort of like, you know, fast way to sort of test and sort of like prototype products. Does it need design thinking? You don't actually need to know what a customer's needs are at that point because you can just A, B test things, right? So look, have a, have a broader kind of like, um, library of methodologies to utilize as you're looking to sort of drive sort of the development of new ideas. Okay. So that's it. Um, I am running a session later on, which is talking about a two hour workshop, which is talking about um, in an environment of radical disruption, um, how do you set up, how does innovation leaders work in terms of organizational design and help set up design for that. Thank you very much for your time. And I'm around for questions if I have any later on.